Okay, well, I'm Joe Perry, and uh, I'm going to give you a, an overview of some of the research activities uh, in the photonics area uh, that we're engaged in, both uh, collaboratively within Georgia Tech, but also, uh, in fact, with uh, institutions around the country uh, and on both coasts, in fact. Uh, so, uh, photonics is a way of using light to communicate, and it's becoming increasingly important as the demands for high data rates uh, in optical networks and even on uh, electronic chips as a means of providing the rate of communication with relatively low power dissipation. And so Intel has a roadmap for putting, well, so the computers we use now have a number of different processor cores. I believe up to seven right now. It may be even higher. I haven't really kept track of it very recently. But in order to have sufficiently rapid communication amongst the, the processing cores, uh, the projection is that we will need to have something on the order of a terabit per second of communication. And the envisioned approach to this, at least uh, uh, from the Intel side, is to use an array of very high speed modulators that are being driven by a variety of different optical wavelengths such that you can have many wavelengths, each operating at a fairly high data rate in order to achieve that, uh, that level of communication. Uh, in terms of kind of more broad scale networking, uh, we know that uh, we've got uh, a seamless integration nowadays between uh, wired and wireless and fiber optic communication networks and Key components in these systems involve, again, uh, trans, uh, transmitting very high data rates. So a couple of approaches that are being pursued, some are already being uh, deployed. Uh, Electro-optic modulators are, are uh, established technologies in terms of a high data rate uh, 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 coupling of signals from antennas into optical networks. but uh, more recently, there's been an interest in doing uh, all optical switching that has the potential for providing data rates at a terabit per second for a, a, an individual optical wavelength. Uh, one thing that you may or may not be aware of is that uh, uh, the, the biggest drive, in addition to high bandwidth, is to reduce power consumption. And I believe that the current figure for the uh, cumulative use of power in data servers, in data farms, uh, is now in the range of 3% of our total energy consumption nationally, which is a pretty uh, uh, surprisingly high figure. Uh, OK, so we are working with uh, a, a vision. Well, so most of the folks here at Georgia Tech uh, would fall on this uh, kind of value line from uh, this regime, which is fundamental principles, materials, device fabrication, demonstrating uh, component primitives, as some people call them, and demonstrating increased functionality. The people in the real world of high-speed optical networking think and work in this domain, and so what we're trying to do is to take a convergent approach, actually communicating and working with people on the optical networking side to understand what it is that we need to deliver in this domain so that we can power the next generation of optical networks. All right, so there's a, a basic paradigm for uh, device platforms that has emerged over about the past uh, 10 to 15 years, which is the marriage of silicon CMOS type technology with organic uh, optical materials. And so 
this is, has been described as an enabling architecture. Uh, and one of the, the key things about the silicon architectures or devices is that you can do a great deal of manipulation and control of the size of optical modes. Uh, and so just as an example, uh, you can see this device over here, uh, which shows a mode intensity distribution in this silicon waveguide that has a little nanoscale slot carved into it by electron beam lithography. And you can see that for a normal silicon waveguide, that mode exists as a large volume and fills up the silicon waveguide. But with this slot in the silicon, a new type of mode emerges that has much smaller, a much smaller area and therefore a much higher intensity for a given amount of optical energy going into that guide. What that does is it allows for uh, uh, being able to do switching performance with relatively low energy but still realizing a high intensity. So these processes uh, that, involve, that we use for switching typically depend on intensity and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. Uh, okay, so that strong confinement provides a, a high interaction between the light and the, the matter. And in these sorts of device platforms, people have demonstrated a variety of interesting high-speed optical switching applications ranging from uh, down conversion, uh, basically mixing of different wavelengths in order to be able to select out particular parts of the information that's on those beams, uh, being able to generate high frequency sidebands by four wave mixing, and also being able in these slotted devices to achieve optical gain such that we could overcome losses in these devices as the light has to traverse uh, over a very complex uh, sur uh, optical circuitry on the chip. Okay, so in our work in this area, we've been focusing on developing conjugated organic materials that can enable both the ultra-high bandwidths that are, that are uh, uh, needed, uh, more importantly perhaps, is achieving very, very low energy or power dissipation per unit switch operation. And so right now, we're typically operating with switch energies that are in the range of picojoules to maybe 100 femtojoules. But in order for these very large scale optical networks to be able to operate at reduced power but still maintain the speed, the increased speed, uh, we've got to get down to below a femtojoule per switch operation. Uh, we need good switching contrast at uh, about a factor of 100 and of course we need low loss and if we're going to utilize these uh, silicon organic hybrid platforms, we've got to have materials and processes that allow us to perform that integration effectively. Okay, so our team here at Georgia Tech along with our collaborators have been working with a highly multidisciplinary approach that includes synthesis and materials development, device fabrication and integration. Uh, there are some intervening pieces that have to do with characterizing and so on the optical characterization of the materials and also on the characterization of uh, the device structures. Uh, and then of course if we pull this off successfully then we'll be able to have integrated devices which we can then go and test performance. Okay, so for some of you who may not be familiar with nonlinear optics, I just want to give like a brief description so that you can understand some of the terminology better. Uh, so if we look at the molecular level and we look at what happens when we apply an electric field to those molecules, we get an induced dipole moment, but if we make the field stronger, we get responses that scale with some power of the electric field. So those are nonlinearities. Those nonlinearities manifest themselves at the material level 
And so in a material, we talk about the susceptibility. So chi-1 is something that actually you may not know it by that term, but it's a optical property that uh, can describe both the refractive index and the absorptivity of a material. Uh, the uh, nonlinearity, chi-3, is able, well, is, is, provides a description of the intensity dependence of the index of refraction or the intensity dependence of absorption. Those two processes would be referred to as nonlinear refraction and two-photon absorption. Each of those mechanisms, even though one changes the phase of electromagnetic waves and the other changes the amplitude of electromagnetic waves, both of those mechanisms can be used to perform efficient switching. So we have a program that's been funded for the past three years uh, by DARPA, which is called the ZOE program. That stands for Xeno-Based Optoelectronics, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But the basic concept here is that we are trying to utilize devices wherein the absorption of energy causes a decoupling. So let me, let me take a step back and rephrase this. So you can see that we've got a little device here that's got two waveguides and this little ring in the middle. Normally, if we put light into this port, it would go and couple into this ring if the spacings and overlaps are set up perfectly. And we can have that then couple to this other guide, and the light will come out here. And that is the off state of the device. The light basically goes in and makes a U-turn and comes out. But to switch, we can switch selectively by using a control beam that will also couple into this ring. But if that ring has a nonlinear material in contact with it, there will be a net loss induced and uh, that is due to two photon absorption, a photon from the propagating beam and a photon from the control beam, such that there's a loss and that loss spoils the coupling of the mode in the waveguide to the ring. And what does it do? It just goes straight through and actually propagates out the through port with very, very little loss. And that seems to be a, a counterintuitive result that you're using absorption to switch something with low loss, but the point is it takes very, very little actual net absorption to make that happen. All right, and so we've made some pretty good progress uh, in the area of developing materials to do these sorts of switchings, and uh, uh, and I won't go into all of the all of the numerical aspects, but let's just say that I believe that we've developed materials with combinations of nonlinear effects and linear optical loss, as well as processability to be actually usable in uh, in devices. Okay, so this basically illustrates uh, the process uh, a, a little bit more clearly. There's a certain frequency in the off state at which the light and the waveguide will couple to the ring and then couple back out. But if we apply a pump beam to the system, then that light that comes out through the signal port will be increased and thereby we get uh, our switching process. Okay, so now we'll go off to some of the material, some of the colorful aspects of this presentation. Uh, we've been working with folks at the University of Washington. Of course, on the synthetic side, Seth Martyr's group is uh, working uh, uh, very, very uh, closely with many of us here. Uh, so uh, this is a compound, which is a polymethine, and it's a material that has both nonlinear refractive index properties and two photon absorption properties. And we work to try to develop uh, processable films that would be suitable for integration with the silicon devices. And uh, so we can see that these guys have, um, well, maybe I should just use this. So uh, their, their spectra in the solution phase 
uh, are very, very sharp in the solid state. In a guest host system with some sort of polycarbonate, they broaden a bit, but they retain much of the same character of the molecules in dilute solution. Uh, we did a systematic study exploring the effect of the counterion structure uh, on the phase behavior of this material in the polycarbonate. What we saw initially was that with certain of these counterions, the films that we made were awful. They had enormous optical losses, and uh, even under optical microscopy, you could see uh, domains forming, and that's not good from an optical point of view. But by engineering these counterions to have a more favorable free energy of interaction between the solute and the polymer, we were able to dramatically improve the solubilization of that material into the APC, and we've able, obviously we've improved the morphology dramatically and made processable films. Okay, and uh, well, I'll just show you that where the two-photon absorption occurs in this material happens to be right in this little region here, and the wavelength is 750, but the photon wavelength that we use for this processing is at 1500 nanometers, which is right smack in the middle of the telecommunication band where we want to be. Okay, uh, so using that sort of material, uh, folks at Cornell fabricated some of these micro ring devices. We did the coding on those devices and they were able to demonstrate for the first time degenerate two photon induced optical switching in that uh, waveguide coupled to a ring optical geometry. And what you can see is that in fact in the off state, uh, so in black is where the off state is, and the transmission is relatively low at that wavelength, and then when we apply a 10 picojoule pulse to the device, then we get a great increase in the throughput transmission. So that demonstrated the concept of using optical loss via organics in these hybrid devices. Okay, there's another way to go about this that makes use of a nonlinear Raman effect. I won't go into the details of what that effect is, but let me just say that uh, conjugated molecules typically have large Raman effects, large Raman scattering cross sections, and uh, so we have been focusing on these uh, uh, molecules which are referred to as uh, uh, apokeratinol, again mixed with a, a, a polycarbonate material to make a blend. And you can see that it's a nice red uh, film. Uh, it's got a couple of very powerful Raman scattering peaks. And it turns out that we can make uh, films from these materials that have linear losses at 2 dBs per centimeter, which is quite, quite low, and uh, Raman loss coefficients, which are really, really high at 35 centimeters per gigawatt. Okay, so I guess I should just say, I, I think I'll skip that and, uh, and show you that if we use apokeratinol, not in an integrated waveguide, but in solution in a hollow fiber, uh, when we pump, so over on this side of the curve, we're just seeing the pump light that's going through the fiber. And down here at, uh, well actually, yeah, down here at lower wavelengths, higher energy, you see these dips. So those dips are a result of inverse Raman scattering that takes power from the pump in the probe and puts it into a totally different frequency, thereby causing switching of the frequency of interest. And uh, so with these materials, we've got a variety of modes that we can work with and with pretty good contrast. So here we've got probably a maximum co contrast that's in the range of about 15 dB, which is, which is a, a pretty good uh, step. Okay. And we're working further to try to improve these materials uh, by uh, manipulation of their chemical structures. 
For example, with the apocaritinel, by putting a stronger acceptor group on, we're able to boost the Raman scattering cross-section by a factor of a couple. <coughs> All right. We're also doing work on doing uh, uh, on uh, materials that allow for phase-based optical switching. And uh, we've had a big breakthrough, actually back in 2010, where in, with compounds developed in Seth's group, uh, we were able to obtain with several variants of a particular class of polymethine dyes uh, extraordinarily high performance in terms of optical switching figure of merit at the molecular level. So the figure of merit that is necessary for optical switching ha has a value of 12. And in this study, we were able to actually realize materials with values over 100. That was in solution at the molecular level. What we've done subsequently is shown that we can take solid state dye-based materials and realize figures of merit that are in the range of 25, still well above the threshold value that's necessary. All right, so both of those types of switchings seem to give us some reasonable performance and a path forward but there are some practical matters that we also have to grapple with on a, on a daily basis. And that is, how do we photostabilize organic materials and devices? Uh, so we utilize encapsulation processes. We do surface modification uh, of the semiconductor surfaces so that when we go and try to do spin coating of organic films onto these devices, that they will wet and conformally fill the topography of the device structure. And we use specific surface modifiers to help promote that. Uh, that's just an example of a pretty good conformal coating of a little silicon ridge waveguide device here. Okay, so then further on the device side, Ali Adibi's group here at Georgia Tech is working to develop a new class of device platforms that are pretty remarkable, and I'll skip over just this uh, overall uh, process uh, slide and just show you what they can do in terms of manipulating light with these device structures. So what they're doing is basically, I, I guess I should have said here, uh, you can see that they've got this ring-shaped thing here, and what they actually do is by multi-step processing, they Bat, they undercut, they etch back the bottom of this structure to basically make something that looks like a little torus on top of a post. But notice this little groove that's sitting right here. That little groove is a slot that they have figured out a way to fabricate by using a wafer bonding method, but it is a nanoscale slot. Okay, so what is the benefit of that slot? is again similar to the vertical slot in the silicon waveguides, but taken even further. So here is uh, one mode of the electric energy density, but look at this mode. This mode is completely confined in that slot, and the quality factor of both of these structures is very impressively high. So that means that you can have coupled power circulating around in this structure for somewhere between 250 and a million uh, cycles, which also helps to accumulate uh, the changes necessary for switching. Okay, so the long-term vision then of this is to reduce voltage, reduce power consumption, and utilize electro-optic and nonlinear optical polymers, as well as gain media, potentially, again, polymeric gain media to be able to switch, modulate, and amplify light within these sorts of device structures. And, well, basically that's the, the take-home message on uh, this device development that's been done, and we're working in earnest uh, to try to bring these uh, organic materials and these same type of device structures that I've just been talking about to combinations that
can provide high performance optical switching properties. Okay, so I will stop there and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm with you. Yes. Actually, let me go back up here. That's So, uh, to be a little clearer about it, I kind of sped through this. So, we were having this problem, and what we started to reason was that with the counter ions that were causing us problems, there wasn't much of a dipole moment and they're, they're charged, but they had fatty groups. These alkyl groups provided sort of a fatty environment around that charge. So at least the rationale that we pursued was to have the chemist, uh, and in this case Alex Jen's group, engineer the counter ions such that we would end up with something that had a bit of a dipole moment as well as the counter ion charge. And we reasoned that that little dipole moment could interact favorably with the weak dipoles in the polycarbonate and sort of become more compatible together. And so that worked out pretty well. So that's going to depend, obviously, on the loss of the organic, assuming that we get good infiltration in there. But uh, he's already done some experiments with some passive uh, polymers. They're pretty low loss to begin with. Uh, but I think that the Qs are still quite high. So it's, it's, I, I think that we may need, with the nonlinear materials, to, to do some things to further reduce some of the loss figures that we have presently, but I think that we'll, even with those, we should be able to demonstrate uh, switching effects. When you started your presentation, you showed this movement with the very fundamental up to networking. Yeah. In, in essence, going from an academic, a pure fundamental <coughs> study to real corporate reality. And one of the things we talked about this morning is this idea that at Coke we're looking to set up this scale-up synthesis laboratory. And I see it, at least in one of your, your mixtures here, I guess it's 50-50 in terms of the host to the molecule. And so is, is having scale-up important for these applications? And do you kind of envision that having the capabilities on campus is going to help us transition? Yes and yes. <laughs> so I, I think it's very important. I mean, we're at the stage now where we're seeing figures of merit for nonlinear refractive materials, which are neat chromophoric films that have low optical loss, excellent figures of merit, and large, not huge, but large nonlinearities. So even to go in now and start to try to do the development of getting those things into the types of devices we would like to would take some scale of material more than the 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams that we might typically get that allows us to spin coat a few films, but probably on the 10 gram scale at, at a minimum to, uh, to be able to really go and do some serious device work with those materials, and what I know is that uh, the folks on the networking end, uh, I, I should have mentioned, uh, the, this, this outfit that we've been collaborating with over the past few months through DARPA is, uh, it used to be called Telecordia, it's now Applied Communication Systems, and they are 
network designers. They're not really hardware people, although many of their people understand hardware very well. But they're really about uh, architectures for high-speed optical networks, but they, they've been wise enough and lucky enough to partner with a program manager at DARPA that appreciates materials that he, put, he brought us together. And, uh, and I think that that, hopefully, as if, if we're able to move forward uh, and, and, and secure further funding in that area, we will uh, we'll be able to do some good stuff.